Okay, guys. Is my friend jumping like a monkey here? Is it all right? Is this good now, jumping like a monkey? I guess he left yesterday when I said, hey, man, you want me to get you a banana? Who knows? All right. Good to see you guys. What's up, first and last? You're always first, and you're never last. Good to see many of you. Again, we'll wait a few minutes. We'll wait a few minutes for the regulars to show up. Thank Jesus Christ, our Lord. We're up to 120. I've seen it go up 160. And again, God purify my heart and my motives, not to be a crowd pleaser, not to prostitute myself for fame and fortune, to speak truth with integrity and only change to be more like Jesus for the glory of Jesus and not because I want people to like me and subscribe to me because that means my motives would be impure if I did it for that reason. So the Holy Spirit save us from our own flesh, from our carnal, sinful desires and crucify our flesh and mortify our flesh and destroy the fruit of our flesh and fill us with life and fruit and power and love from the Holy Spirit, purified in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' almighty name. That's okay, Marcy. What I'm going to do, Marcy, two sisters, <clears throat> because of the questions and requests of two sisters, one of whom was Marcy, what I think I'm going to do tomorrow, Lord willing, I'm going to do a talk on the doctrine of the Trinity. In other words, I'm going to break down and explain what do Trinitarian Christians mean when they speak of the doctrine, the teaching of the Trinity. What do you guys think about that? What's up, my brother Mike? Lord bless you. I think I need to do that. The reason why I think I need to do that is because though I have sessions providing the biblical basis, the biblical foundation, the, the biblical proofs for the Trinity, showing that the Trinity is a revelation of the true God in his word, the Holy Bible, right? That there is one eternal God and three eternal persons, three eternal relationships, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I do not think I have a session where I just define the doctrine of the Trinity, the teaching of the Trinity. What's up, Isaac? Welcome. Everyone, welcome in Jesus' name. So I think I need to do that, and we will make that session the go-to session when people want to know, what do we mean by the Trinity? What do we mean when we say the doctrine of the Trinity? So Lord Jesus willing, the triune God willing, the Father willing, the, the Son, the Lord Jesus willing, the Holy Spirit willing, the one true God, if he wills tomorrow, that's what I think I'm going to do. And that will be our go-to session, right? In other words, when someone asks me, hey, what is the Trinity? Here's the session. I go in-depth defining the teaching doctrine of the Trinity. So we got, what do you guys think if I do that, if the Lord Jesus is pleased? Then I was asked by another sister, and I think I'm going to honor her request because I think it's important. What reasons do we have to believe that the Holy Bible is the Word of God? What reasons? Yeah, in fact, she's here. Annika, how are you, sister? I was just mentioning your request. So Marcy mentioned my sessions on the Trinity. And Annika, Lord Jesus, bless them all, all our sisters in the Lord, all our brothers in the Lord, true brothers and sisters who are truly born of the Spirit in Jesus' name. Annika mentioned or asked me about the evidences, the proofs that the Holy Spirit has given us for the Bible being the Word of God. I think I'm going to do that as well. Go into some of the reasons, some of the proofs that the Holy Spirit has given to trust the Holy Bible as not just historically accurate, but as the inspired revelation of the true God. So Lord willing, I, I think I'm going to start that. I, I need to do that if God is pleased. So where's my boy jumping like a monkey? Is he here? Monkey. It's Daily Light. Are you still on that? Man, you had asked that last time. Are you still on that daily light? What is up with you, man? That was a week ago. You're still wondering about Jesus being our father and brother? <laughs> yeah, let me. I, I, in fact, I was going to answer you, uh, daily light. I was actually going to answer you last time. I ran out of time because I think you were there in one of the sessions. In one of the sessions, I mentioned that. The Bible defines the term father in reference to God as the creator 
maker, sustainer, provider, and life giver of all creation. So Daily Light, let me answer that question for you. Are you listening now? Phantom, I'll answer that real quickly because I want to wait a few more minutes for people to show up, the regulars. Thank God we're over 100. One time we went 160, and in Jesus' name, Lord, bring it to 200 and more for your glory, not for the praise of men, but so more people can benefit. Even though, Lord Jesus, I have detractors who hate me and wish me destruction. I just got a, a, a fan mail. Well, it was in my comment section. And I'm hoping Lily's here. Lily, Lily of the Valley, I invited you to come to the live stream. Can you at least be courageous enough to say, I'm here, please. Don't block me. Don't curse me. Thank you. Why would I block you and why would I curse you? All right. Anyway, I think you were there in one of the sessions, Daily Light, where I explained that the Bible uses the term Father in reference to God in the sense of God being our creator. No, but even before that, I did one on Jesus being our Father. So that was a while back. Our creator, our maker, our sustainer, our life giver. If you define father in that sense, if you define father in reference to God in the sense that God is the one who created the entire creation, who made the entire creation, who gives life to the entire creation and sustains the entire creation, if you define father in that sense, then God the Father is our father. Jesus Christ is his, is his eternal son is our father, and the Holy Spirit is our father. If you define father in that sense, you get my point? So yes, you're correct. And I already addressed that in one of my previous sessions. I don't remember what session it was, but I did. Second attempt, yeah. Isaac, are you upset, my brother? I love you, Isaac, for the sake of Jesus. Are you upset? I didn't get into this topic, but we discussed the necessity to know the biblical foundation for the doctrines of the Christian faith, like the Trinity and the depth of of the infinite love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I hope you're not upset. I hope you're still blessed by it, convicted and challenged. I hope, but it seems like you're upset, Isaac. And you're a Trinitarian, Isaac? Just hopefully you are. God willing, Isaac, Lord willing, tomorrow I'm going to do an entire session on the doctrine of the Trinity, explaining what the doctrine of the Trinity, teaching of the Trinity <clears throat> entails. What do we mean by Trinity? <clears throat> And explaining it thoroughly, and I'll be the go-to session. So, Lord willing, pray for tomorrow that I'm around, I'm healthy, but more importantly, holy. Holy, pure, sold out, filled with the Spirit to worship Jesus, love Jesus, obey Jesus, live for Jesus, even die for Jesus if necessary. Right? And tomorrow we're going to do it, God willing. Because you never know, the Lord may call me home. Right? He may call me home tonight. As long as I'm clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, washed in the blood of the Lamb, sealed by the Spirit, no better place to be than in the presence of Jesus where I see him visibly in his glorified physical body and bow before his beautiful feet and kiss his feet in Jesus' name. Something I'm not worthy of, but because of his righteousness, which I plead, I will enter in Jesus' name. Yeah, God willing, Luisa, tomorrow. So, guys, let your friends know. Inform your friends. Tomorrow, God willing, Sam is going to do an entire session, which will be the go-to session from now on, on defining the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity. It's not so much going into the Bible to present the proof for the Trinity because I've done sessions on that. And I will, God willing, in the future do more sessions on that. And I have dozens of articles on the Trinity. The biblical proof for God being triune and that Jesus is God in the flesh. So in Jesus' name tomorrow. So let's just tell the Father we love him and thank him and praise him. We love you, Father. We worship you. Though we don't love you the way we should. And to our shame, we don't worship you the way we should, but empower us by your spirit to love you perfectly, to live and obey you perfectly, to live for you, Father, to worship you perfectly, to love your son, to be in love with your son, to love and be in love with your Holy Spirit. We need you, Father. We need you, Lord Jesus. We need your Holy Spirit. And Father, please save us from our flesh. Destroy our flesh and save us from the stains and the, and the lust and the passions of the flesh. To be empowered by your spirit, to crucify the flesh and walk in the life of the Spirit. Give us the power to know your word, to then obey your word, to live your word, to love your word, to proclaim your word, and if necessary, die for your word, Father. Please save us to never betray you or deny you or blaspheme your name, Father. 
And even those who seek to harm us and attack us and slander us, forgive them, Father. In Jesus' name, forgive them. Lord Jesus, forgive them. Holy Spirit, forgive them. And forgive me for not dealing with them in a Christ-like manner. Help me, Father. Constrain me from being unnecessarily offensive and save me from un my unrighteous anger and unholy indignation. Please, my God. Anoint my mouth to speak truth without error, Father. Bless this session. Enable me to recall the passages and interpret them correctly by the power of your Spirit. And bless everyone here with wisdom and knowledge and understanding from your Holy Spirit. Open the eyes of our hearts and minds. Open our ears to hear clearly, to see clearly, and give us the power then to obey your word. For the glory of Jesus, may he increase in us and we decrease, Father. Cover us and wash us in the blood of Jesus. And save us and shield us from Satan and his agents, his children. Save us, Father. Save me from a corrupt legal system by the power of your Holy Spirit. Save our loved ones, my daughters. Wash them and cleanse them and purify them in the blood of Jesus. And seal them, all our loved ones who don't know you. And even those who know you and us. Seal us by your Spirit, Father. And provide through us, Father. To never betray you. To never deny you. Never blaspheme your name. And never prostitute ourselves for money or for fame. We need you, my God, to save us from that. Have your way in this session, Father. And please bless this session. Bring more people to listen. Beatify the channel for your glory, Father. Not for my, my praise. Not for self-seeking interest. Save me from that, that my motives will be pure for the glory of Jesus. Jesus, increase, we decrease. Please, my God, we need you. And Lord, destroy all distractions of the enemy and bless the internet connection. We need you desperately every day. We love you, Abba. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Take over, Holy Spirit, and bless your people. In Jesus' almighty name, Yahweh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, amen. Okay, guys, good to see you. Hopefully, we'll have more people coming. Hold on. Sorry about that. I know, I know Lily of the Valley is listening. All right. Lily, are you there? Come on, Lily. Come on, come on, wherever you are. Okay, good. Praise God. Yeah, we just started too. So in Jesus' name, we're going to continue where I left off on foreshadowings of Christ, how the entire Old Testament, historical events, uh, the lives of the patriarchs and the prophets, Moments in Israel's history were all designed by the sovereign God and creator <clears throat> to point to Jesus Christ. And by the way, Daily Light, you got the answer, right? Daily Light, you got the answer that Jesus is not the Father, which you agree, but with the Father and the Spirit, he can be called our Father in the sense that Jesus with the Father and the Holy Spirit, the three persons of the Godhead, the one God, created all things, made all things, Sustain all things, give life to all, th all things. So in that sense, all three persons of the Godhead, they're not the same person. They are three eternal relationships in love with one another. But all three of them are our father in that sense. I just want to repeat that. I did a session on this. So Jesus is not the person of the father. The father is a different person from the son who's a different person from the spirit. And God willing, tomorrow, Lord Jesus willing, tomorrow I'm going to do an entire session. If it takes me two hours or more. I will define these terms. What do we mean by the doctrine of the Trinity, the teaching of the Trinity? What do we mean that there's one God? What do we mean by person? God willing, tomorrow we'll go in depth on that. But yes, the Father, who is not the Son and He's not the Spirit, is our Father. The Son, Jesus Christ, who is not the Father and He's not the Spirit, He's our Father. The Holy Spirit, who is not the Father and He's not the Son, He's our Father, in that all three persons, being the one God, created all creation, made all creation. Gives life to all creation, provides for all creation, sustains all creation. So in that sense, the three persons of the Godhead are our Father. Right? Is that clear? Everyone got it? And folks, if you're wondering why I'm a little earlier than normal, because it's now 4 p.m., 4.15 Eastern Standard Time, because our dear brother, Protestant believer, has a commitment that he needs to attend to. 
So this worked perfectly with a schedule. So thank the mods for serving me to serve you. Pray for them and their families. Thank for the last Protestant because they're not only here as mods, they also are working on my YouTube channel to beatify it in Jesus' name. And hopefully when the session's over, he's going to change that ugly looking thumbnail. Dude, I was looking at that thumbnail and my nostrils, they're monstrous, man. Woo. I got a face that even a mother has a hard time loving. So, Phantom, it's a good time for you, right? Because you just woke up. By the way, Phantom. Oh, that's not Phantom. It's PlayStationiano. PlayStationiano, we don't say L-M-A-O. We say L-M-B-O. Laughing my butt off because we want to keep it G-rated, right? Come on, brother. You're a Christian. I don't care what they say about you. All right. Now, with that said, foreshadowings of Christ. Why should we expect to find... The Old Testament stories, which are of Christ. Why should we expect to find the Old Testament stories, which are an actual splitting of the Red Sea? These are all historical facts, facts of history. They're not myth, right? They're not fantasy. They're not make-believe. Yet, even though they are historical events, real-life events that actually took place, these events were designed in such a way to point to a greater event, a greater spiritual reality. And it's not just historical events. The priesthood, the temple, the sacrifices, all of these things were designed by the sovereign triune God to point to the life, mission, and ministry of Jesus Christ. Okay, thank you, Mike. I, Mike, without you, I don't know what I would do. Thank you, Mike AD. Praise the Lord. Without you, I'd be lost, brother. But thank you for your existence because I was lost until I met you. Okay, now let me give you a passage again to affirm this point. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. And then we're going to go, we're going to begin. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. Come on, Lily Valley. Just put a one if you're here. Colossians 2, 16 to 17. Read with me and pay attention to the implication of what Paul wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you. Hey, Lily, you're here. God bless you. See, Lily thought that I was going to invite him or her to attack. I'm not going to attack. God bless you. Thank you for, for coming here. Stick around, Lily, and hopefully you'll still benefit in spite of the fact that you have issues with my attitude. So pray for me. See, that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to entice you to show up so you can learn and benefit in spite of my imperfections causing you to stumble. Guys, just uh, bless Lily and praise Lily. I mean, praise Jesus for Lily. Lord bless you, Lily. Pay attention now. Colossians 2, 16 to 17. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Yeah, it is actually a good name. Lily of the Valley, uh, side note, did you get that from Song of Solomon? Right? The Rose of Sharon, Lily of Valley. All right, yeah, I'm trying to figure out the Rose of Sharon. All right. All right. Anyway, guys, pay attention. It's okay, Lily. I I love you for the sake of the Lord. I know I come off harsh, attacking, but as long as you love Jesus, as long as you learn about the faith and grow more passionate love with Jesus, I really don't care what people think about me because I'm not important. Lily, just for the record, I am an insignif insignificant troll, worm, an oversized, bald dog, even though I'm a good-looking dog. You can despise me, but as long as you learn the faith, as long as you fall more in love with Jesus, that's all that matters to me. So that's all that matters. Okay, now Colossians 2, 16 and 17. I knew that would get you to come. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Okay, by the way, do you guys want us to go back to the King James? And I'll tell you in a future session why I choose the King James. That's my personal conviction, and I'm not trying to convince you of it. But do you guys want us King James? Do you guys want King James? Okay. All right, we'll stick with King James if you're okay. Okay, let's stick with the King James. King James it is. If the king ain't on it, the king ain't in it. If the king ain't on it, the king ain't in it. Suckers. All right. Let no 
man therefore judge you in meat, in meat, or in drink, or in respect of any holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, okay, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ, right? Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Okay, let me explain what Paul just said. Here's where I need you to pay attention so you can benefit. Let me explain what Paul just said. Paul said the Sabbath days, the Sabbath year, the holy days, Passover, Sukkoth, Feast of Tabernacle. All of those are a shadow. Did you guys catch it? All of those are a shadow. The reality, the substance, the body of which is Christ. And remember what I said in the previous session. When you see a shadow, that signifies someone or something is about to appear, right? Someone or something is about to show up. And by the shadow, you can get an idea of what that thing or someone looks like. In other words, remember what I said, and I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to guide me and illuminate you to understand the word and fall in love with Jesus more passionately. If I see a shadow that looks like a dog, by golly, a dog is going to show up, right? If I see a shadow that looks like a cat, that means a cat will show up. In other words, if I see a shadow that looks like a dog, I'll be shocked if a gorilla pops up. If I look at a shadow, right, that looks like a gorilla, I'll be shocked if a whale pops up, right? Yes, guys, listen to Hello World because he thinks he's hurting me. Go to Satanic Watch and watch the videos exposing me because Satanic Watch, i.e. Takia, has got nothing better to do but attack CP and me to make himself famous. Gee, I'm losing sleep. <laughs> They're attacking me with video. All right. By the grace of Jesus, focus. All right. Now focus here. The Old Testament is a shadow. By the shadow, you will know who's about to show up. Someone is going to appear because the shadow signifies someone's coming. And by the look and shape and desire of the shadow, they'll give you an idea of what to expect when the reality shows up. Everyone clear on that? Everyone clear on that? You understand? So what is Paul trying to say what are the inspired New Testament authors trying to say? The Old Testament is a shadow preparing you for Jesus. That means if you understand the Old Testament as a shadow, you understand the Old Testament is not the reality. The Old Testament is preparing you for the reality. In other words, the entire history of the Old Testament is God's preparation for his people and the world for the real deal, Jesus the Messiah. And by looking at the Old Testament carefully, it will give you an idea of what to expect when that reality shows up. Is that making sense? Because I don't want to lose any of you. Is that making sense? In other words, the appearing of Jesus, the God-man who died on the cross for our sins, who rose again, who is a priest in the order of Melchizedek, not from the line of Aaron, none of that should shock you None of that should scandalize you because all of that was already taught in the Old Testament. The Old Testament already prepared you to expect such a Messiah. See, that's what I want you to understand. I can't move on until you get this point. And by the grace of God's Spirit, you'll understand, right? All of this prepared you not to be shocked and scandalized by the kind of Messiah Jesus turned out to be, but that when he showed up, and he turned out to be that kind of Messiah, you should have said, oh, yeah, we were expecting that. It's all in the Old Testament. The Old Testament prepared us for a Messiah who would be God in the flesh, who would be the Son of God, who would be a priest, who would offer his life as a sacrifice for our sins, rise from the dead, ascend into glory, and return to judge. See, the Old Testament already prepared us for that reality. So why were the Jews caught off guard? Because they did not understand and discern the shadows accurately. They were all over the map, and they misunderstood much of the Old Testament. And that shouldn't shock you or surprise you, because we find the same thing happening with Christians today. 
Because even though we have the New Testament and we know Jesus will return physically and bodily, note the confusion among Christians regarding the exact nature of Christ's return. When he returns, will he first rapture the church before the seven-year tribulation or in the midpoint? Or are we going through the tribulation only at the end will he rapture, rapture us up? And is the tribulation seven years? Is there a tribulation? And is there a rapture? And will he reign 1,000 years on earth? Or is his reign not literally 1,000 years? It's simply a symbolic number signifying that Christ rules perfectly and ere he began his millennial reign in heaven. You see the confusion? Even now, now that we have the entirety of God's revelation and scripturated, even now, with the entirety of God's written revelation at our disposal, we still are confused about the exact nature of Christ's physical bodily return to the earth. You get my point? Louisa, you're not the only one confused. The whole world is confused. You see my point. So then what? why would you be surprised and shocked that the Jews who didn't have the reality, they only had the shadow, they too would be confused and fail to properly understand the shadows, the 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 types, the the foreshadowings, and the. Why would you be surprised? So is that clear? Are you getting the point? So we can move on by the grace of God. Now I'm going to blow you in, show you how. I'll talk about the Sabbath a little later, but I'm going to give you an example because I'm going to go back to Jesus being Israel. Okay, I'm going to go back. And Lily, are you still here, Lily? Are you still listening? Hopefully you are. I'm going to show you how everything in the Old Testament, in due course, God willing, the sacrificial system, the priesthood, the Sabbath, the holy days, circumcision, they all point to Jesus Christ. But I'm going to give, give you just one example right now, right now. And then we're going to go into, into Jesus being Israel. Or should I do Adam? See, there's so many good <laughs> shadows of Christ. Yeah, I think I'm going to do Adam. I wanted to do Israel, but I think, man, there, it's all over. So I don't know where to begin. Should I start with Adam? Should I start with Israel? Should I start with David? God willing, we'll do Adam. But let me show you how circumcision. You guys want me to show you how circumcision? Creation, don't worry about it. Creation, my brother, don't fall for the schemes of the devil. The devil, working through that agent of the devil, wants you to focus on that attack and assault and slander to be distracted and distract others. Don't feed into it. Focus on Jesus. It's about Jesus, not me. Let them attack. Who cares? I'm lo As you can see, I'm losing sleep. They're attacking me. <laughs> Lord, they're attacking me. <laughs> focus on Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about CP. It's about Jesus. It's about his honor. It's about his glory. It's about his majesty. Creation. The apostles had Christians who were so-called Christians, were actually fake Christians, used as the devil, attacking them. Jesus had even one of his own apostles, Judas, betraying him. Who am I? Am I better than Paul? I can't. I'm not worthy to stoop down to untie the sandals of Paul, let alone the sandals of Jesus, his God and my God. Focus. Don't let Satan distract you. Focus. It's not about my integrity or my reputation. The hell with me. And I'm telling you honestly, who gives a darn about me? It's about Jesus. May I disappear. May he increase. May he be glorified. And me save me from my own flesh so I don't shame him. Focus on Jesus. It's all about him. Okay. Now, let me show you how circumcision points to Christ. Are you ready? I'm going to show you how circumcision points to Christ. Write this down. We're not going to look at it, but write this down. Genesis 17, 9 to 14. Genesis 17, verses 9 to 14. Write it down. Read it at your own leisure. Okay. Genesis 17, verses 9 to 14. Write it down. <clears throat> write it down. Read it at your own leisure. There God commissions Abraham to circumcise male infants, male infants on the eighth day, on the eighth day. Okay. 
I'm going to show you why the a day in a minute. But first of all, let me show you something amazing about this commission. And it's something we only recently discovered. Did you know this is a medical fact? And a medic is here. He's a medic student. He can confirm this. Did you know that the body produces vitamin K on the eighth day? A baby, when a baby is born, the body produces vitamin K on the eighth day. And vitamin K is a natural blood clotting agent. It prevents excessive bleeding. Did you know that? How many of you guys know that? Okay, so I, I, medic, I think he was here, but anyway. Did you know why that's amazing? Notice the day in which God has male infants circumcised. On the eighth day, the precise day when vitamin K is produced, acting as a blood clotting agent, preventing excessive bleeding. Do you see now the health benefit of obeying God and doing it exactly as God has commanded? Do you know that? Medic just commented, right? Yes, but that's the thing. You're having them, doctors, inject vitamin K when the baby is born, whereas medically, vitamin K is produced in the body on the eighth day. I'm not making it up. This is a fact of science. The last time I checked. And again, I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to protect me from error. Hopefully the source I received this from wasn't misinforming me. So, so, but you understand? Look it up, medic. Confirm it for me because I heard it from medical authorities. So what's my point? Is it a coincidence that God says, circumcise your male infants on the eighth day because that's the day that God designed the body to produce vitamin K, which is a blood thinner. It acts as a blood clotting agent. Remember, this is a pre-scientific age. You understand how mind-blowing your Bible is? It's truly the word of the creator who knows creation better than anyone else. Okay, now, what's the significance of the eight day? First, let me explain to you what circumcision symbolizes, what circumcision points to. Okay, let me explain to you what circumcision points to. Let's go to Deuteronomy 10.16. Deuteronomy 10.16. Medic, you know why? Because doctors are not patient on God, and they think they know better than God, so inject babies with vitamin K as opposed to waiting for it to naturally form in the body on the eighth day. Deuteronomy 10, 16. The doctors are trying to outdo God. So instead of having natural vitamin K produced in your body, you, you introduce synthetic vitamin K into the body of a baby. Right? Deuteronomy 10, 16. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. Folks, please follow with me so you can benefit. Physical circumcision was a sign of something greater, spiritual circumcision. Did you catch it? Why did God have males circumcised in eight day? Because the cutting off of the foreskin was a physical act signifying the need to cut off the foreskin of your evil hearts. So physical circumcision points to the need of spiritual circumcision, what we call being born again, being made new, the new creation. Do you see what physical circumcision points to? Physical circumcision points to the need for spiritual circumcision, where the Holy Spirit cuts off the evil from your hearts and your minds. Everyone focused? Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Watch here. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. You understand why God has to perform spiritual circumcision? He has to spiritually circumcise your spiritual hearts and your minds, cutting off that evil nature, that evil inclination, your bondage to sin, in order to enable you now to love God and obey him. So 
physical circumcision points to the necessity of spiritual circumcision, which is to be born again. So I hope you're following this. Already in the Hebrew Bible, God told his people, you need to be born again. You need to be made a new creation. You need spiritual circumcision because if I don't spiritually circumcise you, that evil inclination will enslave you and ensnare you and make it humanly impossible for you to love me the way I deserve to be loved. So I have to perform spiritual circumcision in order to empower you to now live for me and love me. In other words, the teaching of being born again, the teaching of being made a new creation in Christ, spiritually anew, is not a New Testament teaching. It's an Old Testament teaching which the New Testament confirms and fulfills. You with me there? Are you understanding what you're learning? Being born again, a new creation. God bless you for your support. God bless you guys. Being born again, being a new creation, right? Being born anew from above, that is not a New Testament revelation. It is a revelation in the Old Testament, which the New Testament simply builds on fulfills and confirms let me show you that in other passages of the bible let me show you in other passages where god clearly tells his people you need to be born again you need to be born anew you need to be born of the spirit you need to be spiritually circumcised you need to be turned into new creatures otherwise you won't be able to fear me and love me okay let me give you another one ezekiel 36 Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. I hope you guys are learning because I'm going to show you how circumcision points to Christ. Watch here. Guys, as long as you listen and you don't get distracted, pay attention because I want you to learn the depth and beauty and majesty of the Bible. It's truly the word of God. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. This is, again, spiritual cleansing, spiritual water. That signifies being cleansed by the Spirit. And I'll prove that a little later. I'll show you how water is often used as a metaphor for the Holy Spirit. Right? Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. That's how you know it's not physical water, because this water cleanses you spiritually of your spiritual defilement. Right? Right? So the water here will be a symbol of the Holy Spirit because the water is often used as a metaphor for the Holy Spirit. And I'll show you that in a minute. But just focus now on the key point, though. Notice here being born again, the language of being born again. A new heart also will I give you. Wow. A new heart, a new creation, a new person, a new man, a new woman, a new creation. Oh, wow. So you mean the Old Testament already announced the new birth? Being born again, being born anew, being born of the Spirit. Yeah, it was always there in the Old Testament, long before the New Testament mentioned it. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Did you catch it? I will give you a new heart, and I'll put my spirit in you to renew your spirit. And once the spirit indwells you, my Holy Spirit indwells you and renews your spirit and heart, then you'll be able to love me and obey me. How many of you now, most of you have been following me for the years and have listened to my sessions, you already knew this. Thou shall not pontificate first and last. You guys already heard this. For the newbies, those who are hearing me for the first time, how many of you knew that being born again was already taught in the Old Testament? The newbies, not those who've been with me for a while, who've heard this before. All right. Good. Then praise God. Most of you already knew this. Those of you who don't, amen. At least you're learning. Okay, so you see that, right? Being born again, 
being born anew, being born of the Spirit, being made a new creature was taught in the Old Testament. And one of the languages used in the Old Testament to signify the new birth is spiritual circumcision. I will circumcise the foreskin of your hearts. I will circumcise your ears. That's in the Old Testament. We saw it in Deuteronomy 10, 16. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Did we read Deuteronomy 30, verse 6 in Jeremiah 4, 4? Chapter 4, verse 4? Man, I even forgot. I know Deuteronomy 10, 16 we read. Did we look at Deuteronomy 30, verse 6? Okay, let's look at Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4. Max, that's the only good thing that came out of Haterwood, that he pointed you to me, because he puts people to sleep. Okay, Jeremiah 4, verse 4. See, again, so much information. Pray that God will give me clarity of thought to recall this accurately. Guys, notice Jeremiah 4, verse 4. Circumcise yourselves to Jehovah and take away the foreskins of your heart. Wait, wait. My heart has a foreskin that needs to be cut off? Like physical circumcision cuts off the physical foreskin? Take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doing. So notice Jeremiah says, God is ordering you Judeans, that foreskin of your heart needs to be cut off because that foreskin is what makes you evil and enslaves you to sin. You need to cut it off so now that you're free from the bondage of sin so you can walk in the life and power of the Spirit. Everyone see that? And by the way, Bass, you know that me and David Wood, we banter, right? Me and him are brothers for life until we die and enter glory. A lot of people don't know. We banter. You see, he takes shots at me on his live streams and I because we love each other. That's the way we show our love for each other. Now, imagine if we really hated each other. Christian warrior. Absolutely, yes. And Christian warrior. You know where you're going to find that? In 1 Peter chapter 3, 19 to 21. Absolutely, yes. Paul, you, Peter, by inspiration of the Spirit, Points to the flood as being a picture of Christ and his resurrection and new creation. 1 Peter 3, 19 to 21. We're not going to turn there. Now, let me show you how much Jeremiah knew about the new birth. Why? Stop telling me. I got allergies, Art Bell. Don't let me ring your bell. I got to touch my face because allergies are killing me. Even though I took a strong allergy medicine today. All right. Jeremiah 13, 23. Jeremiah 13, 23. Watch here. Jeremiah 13, 23. Let me show you how much Jeremiah the prophet knew about the deadness of man, the evil nature that enslaves human beings, and their need to be born again. Let me show you how much he knew. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. What is God saying here? When the leopard can shed his spots, then you can do good who are accustomed to evil, who are ensnared by evil, who are taken <clears throat> bondage by evil. Do you see what he's saying? In other words, if you're used to evil, you've been enslaved by evil, you're in bondage to evil, there's no way you can do good in the sight of God any more than the leopard can shed his spots. And this is Jeremiah. This is Old Testament. Notice what else Jeremiah says about the human heart that's fallen and corrupted by sin. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. And I'm going to show you how it all points to Jesus. I'm going to show you. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Did you catch it? Okay. Jeremiah is being told by God to tell the people before Christ, your heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can comprehend the evil of the heart? That's what it means. Who can know it? Who can comprehend just how evil the human heart is? By the way, this destroys the common theme and slogans and songs. Your heart don't lie. Trust in your heart. 
listen to your heart. And God says, you are a fool and you're a damn fool if you listen to your heart. You understand? Those slogans, those songs that encourage you to trust in your heart and listen to your heart, that is an anti-biblical message. God says the last thing you do is listen to your heart because your heart is corrupt. It's evil. It will deceive you and mislead you. And anyone and everyone who's followed their heart has learned the hard way. That was the stupidest thing you could have done. Amen? You don't listen to your heart. You listen to God's counsel, even if that counsel goes against what your heart says. You listen to the counsel of God over against your heart. Because God's counsel is perfect, your heart is wicked and deceitful and will lead you to a path of destruction. Let me show you that. Proverbs 28, 26. Is the Bible amazing or what? You see how one verse <clears throat> points to another verse and opens up another topic? Okay, Proverbs 28, 26. Okay. Better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness. You know what, 28, 26, you Alzheimer's. Man, you make a strong case for Alzheimer's, dude. Proverbs 28, verse 26. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Post that one more time. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. But whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. Guys, memorize that verse. Etch it in your heart and write it on the walls of your home and on your kitchen. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. But if you follow the counsel of the wise, wise men, those filled with wisdom of the Holy Spirit, you will be delivered. So you know that song? I forgot the name of the band. Listen to your heart. Listen to Burn the CD. Flag the video. Get that YouTube channel shut down. Right? Burn the CD. That is an anti-biblical message. God says, don't trust in your heart. Go to Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. Because your heart is deceitful and wicked. Who can comprehend the depth of its wickedness? But trust in the counsel of God. Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. Exactly, Bass. You anticipated where I was going. Remy, I don't trust your own heart either. Trust in the, the Lord Jehovah with all thine heart. See? Bring your heart in submission to Jehovah's commandments. Bring your heart. Under the subjection of the wisdom of Jehovah. Don't follow your heart's desires. Make your heart follow God's wisdom and his commands. Trust in Jehovah the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Is the Bible beautiful or what? The Bible... Knows man better than man knows himself because the one who produced the Bible is the creator of man. And God knows the human condition better than anyone. And he's telling you, don't be stupid and follow your heart. Yeah, but brother, in my heart, I feel it. I feel this is the man for me. And when I see him, I see Jesus in him. And I get the butterflies. <laughs> and then two years later, you're used, abused, and dumped and divorced. Right? Isn't that true? Am I lying? I know people right now that you can, a blind man can see that this person shouldn't be with her and this sister shouldn't be with him. A blind man can see. But if you tell them, no, brother, it's different. You don't know, brother. He's just different. He makes me feel different. And you know what's ironic? Let's be honest. This is what I call the honeymoon phase. Someone else called it the, the, the romance stage. Every time you start a relationship with someone, it always feels like he's the one and he's treated you differently from the previous guys and vice versa. When will we learn? When will we fools learn 
We said the same thing about the previous relationship. Right? No, this is different, brother. This guy here makes me feel special. What about the 20 other guys? Weren't they all, all different every time you went? No, no, but you see. You... And for the ref record, FYI, let me repeat. Let me repeat this like a broken record. FYI, Christians who love Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit must mortify the flesh because there is no premarital sex. I know that's hard for some and it's a struggle, but I have to mention this because I'm going to answer to Jesus Christ if I fail to mention this. Jesus says the only time you can have sexual intimacy is when you're married, one born male in gender, one born female in gender, who come together as husband and wife before the Lord. That's the only time you can be sexually active. Any other time you are sinning against Jesus Christ. I have to repeat this because I see in churches today, I walk in churches and you have guys and girls who are boyfriends and girlfriends who are not married and some of them living together who are active sexually. They are sexually active. So I have to have a clear conscience before God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I, by the power of the Spirit, will honor Jesus and never touch anyone sexually until marriage. By the power of the Holy Spirit, save us, Lord. Because I know it's a struggle for men and women. I know it's a struggle for me too. But we must honor the Lord and crucify our flesh for the glory of Christ. You cannot have sex before marriage. I'm sorry, I didn't write the Bible. The Creator wrote it, and He knows what's best for us. Even though we may not understand the wisdom in, in that commandment. And Lord willing, I will do a session on the wisdom on not being sexually active until you're married. There's a wisdom behind it. A wisdom meant to save you, not harm you. Save you from irreparable physiological and psychological damage. I promise you, it's for our best that God has given us that command. Trust his wisdom. Trust his love. Lord willing, in the future, I'll talk about it. But don't forget the point. Jeremiah knew about the human condition quite <clears throat> informed by revelation. The human condition after the fall, corrupted, tainted, perverted by evil. Our hearts are evil. Our physical bodies ensnared to sin. Evil inclination taking us into bondage, which is why Jeremiah says, you need the foreskin of your heart circumcised. So he knew about the new creation. Jeremiah 24, verse 7. Jeremiah 24, 7, as the Holy Spirit enables me to perfectly recall these passages. Please, Holy Spirit, for the glory of Christ. Jeremiah 24, verse 7. And I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord Jehovah, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with all, with their whole heart. Folks, can I ask you a question? Why does God need to give them a new heart? A heart to know him, if the heart they have is able to know him. Because... Their heart is evil. Remember Jeremiah 17, verse 9? The heart is desperately wicked. It's evil. No one can comprehend how evil the heart is if it goes unchecked by God. And therefore, God in his mercy gives you a new heart, a heart to know him. And he circumcises the foreskin of your heart. Is it making sense? Is it making sense now? You guys getting it? Jeremiah 32, 39 to 40, but we're going to read Jeremiah 32, 38 to 40. Lily, is it making sense to you too, Lily? Jeremiah 32, 38 to 40. Sorry about that. I keep hitting the table. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart. And in one way, that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. But I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. So notice, I will give them one heart, a new heart to fear me, to never turn from me, to never sin. So I don't have to punish them, but be their God. 
Is it clear for all of you that the Old Testament, the Old Testament already taught the deadness of man in sin, our bondage to sin, and the need to be a new creation, to be born anew, born again by the Holy Spirit? Is that clear to everyone? And one of the ways in which the Old Testament signified the need to be made new, to be transformed, is to speak of our hearts and our ears being circumcised. Obviously, that's not physical, that's literal. So the Bible, the Hebrew Scriptures specifically, mentioned the need of spiritual circumcision. The foreskin of your heart has to be circumcised. Your ears have to be circumcised, cut open. So note, physical circumcision, the act of physical circumcision, pointed to a greater reality, spiritual circumcision. And the New Testament picks it up. Acts 7, verse 51. Acts 7, verse 51. Okay. Yeah, hit that like button, folks. Come on. Acts 7, 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. This is Stephen filled with the Spirit, talking about the Jews who hate him and hate Jesus and are about to murder him. Ye stiff-necked and un uncircumcised in heart and ears. Ye de you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Did you catch what he just said? Because your hearts are uncircumcised and your ears are uncircumcised, you cannot help but fight the Holy Spirit. In other words, if you are spiritually uncircumcised, you are incapable of obeying the Spirit, follow the Spirit, and submit to the Spirit until the Holy Spirit performs spiritual circumcision. You got it? Did you read? Put it one more time so they can catch it. Acts 7.51. Acts 7.51 so they can catch it again. Catch it. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do you. Notice, even your fathers before you, they were uncircumcised in hearts and ears. So like... Like you, they also resist the Holy Spirit. So notice the implication. Why the Old Testament says, my people need to be spiritually circumcised. Because if you're not spiritually circumcised, then you're going to constantly fight the Holy Spirit, resist the Holy Spirit, and oppose the true prophets and the true Messiah to your destruction. Exactly. And I've done sessions, Christian Warrior, on the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. They're on my YouTube channel, and I have articles on that. Lord willing, I'll repeat those sessions in, in the future, Lord willing. So everyone is sinking in now, right? Man, this physical circumcision, who would have thought it? It's pointing to something greater, spiritual circumcision, which is simply another way of saying the need to be born again. It was always there. Now, do you see how the Old Testament is all pointing to Christ? And the New Testament is the perfect completion of the Old Testament? Because I know some people wondered, what's the connection between the Old Testament and New Testament? The better question is, where isn't there a connection? Where isn't there a connection? You with me there? Clear? But now, what does the new creation represent? Well, let me give you another passage. I'm sorry. Romans 2, 26 to 29. Because I remember what's my point to show how Jesus fulfills this. Romans 2, 26, 29. Another passage on spiritual circumcision. And then we're going to talk about Adam, hopefully. Let's see how much time I got. Okay, guys, don't let these people distract you with side conversation. I have nothing to do with a topic because they're here being used by the devil to distract. Okay, now... Romans 2, 26 to 29. Guys, pay attention. Paul is talking about the Jews, and he calls them the uncircus uncircumcision party. I'm sorry. Paul is talking about Jews and Gentiles. He calls the Gentiles the uncircumcision group because they didn't circumcise necessarily. 
And the Jews he calls the circumcision group. So when he says the circumcision, he means the Jews. The uncircumcision, he means the Greeks, the Gentiles. So pay attention there, okay? Now note what he says. Therefore, if the uncircumcision, i.e. the Gentiles who are not physical Jews, keep the righteousness of the law, try to obey the demands of the law, right? Shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? What Paul is saying here is basically this. So what? You got physically circumcised, but you break the law. You commit adultery. You lie. You steal. You cheat. You slander. You gossip. You murder. You don't pray. You don't fast. You don't take care of the poor or the widow. And you don't go to synagogue. Does your physical circumcision mean anything? Or is it now meaningless? Now, in contrast, the Gentile, he's not physically circumcised, but he prays. He fasts. He goes to synagogue or church at this time. He cares for the poor. He cares for the needy. He cares for the widow. He doesn't gossip. He doesn't slander. He doesn't lie. He doesn't cheat. He's not sexually immoral. You're telling me because he's not physically circumcised, he's condemned, and you're not? You see what Paul's point is? That's what he's trying to say here. Then Romans 2, 27, 29. Let's break it down. And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, meaning physically, nature meaning physical nature, shall him... Who is not circumcised physically, because no one's born circumcised. If it fulfill the law, will judge thee who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. Now, what is he saying here? That man who is physically not circumcised, but if he keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will he not condemn you before God as a witness against you who failed to keep the letter of the law? Okay, so you understand what Paul is saying here. Now, Romans 2, 28, 29, as the Holy Spirit gives us wisdom to understand. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Who cares you're a physical Jew? That doesn't mean because you're a physical Jew, you get a free pass. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. So what you got physically circumcised? If you're dead in sin and walking in sin, your ethnicity and your circumcision will do nothing for you on the day of judgment. So then what matters, Paul? Romans 2.29. What matters then, Paul? But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, a spiritual Jew. And circumcision is of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Wow. Wait, Paul. Did you just make this up? Spiritual circumcision in contrast to physical circumcision? Or is this taught in the Old Testament? And Paul says, I'm simply repeating and confirming what's in the Old Testament. Everyone got it? How many of you are blown away with the beauty and the wisdom and the depth of the Bible? How amazing the Bible is. Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, but we're going to read verses 1 to 3. Philippians 3, verse 3, but we're going to read verses 1 to 3. Because I'm going to show you how it points to Jesus. Many of you already know the connection because you've heard me teach this in the past. Philippians 3, verses 1 to 3. Cave verses 3. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same thing to you. To me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Did you catch it? Repeating the same things in letter or word doesn't burden me. It brings me joy because I delight to remind you and repeat the things you know because we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature. So don't ever think you're burning me or, or <clears throat> torturing me by having to repeat the same thing. No, I delight in reminding you and repeating the same thing because I want to make sure it sinks in by the power of the Holy Spirit becomes second nature. That's what Paul is saying here. Now watch here, verse 2. Beware of the dogs, beware of evil, doer, evil workers, beware of the concision. Here he's calling physical Jews who deny the true gospel, who oppose Paul. He calls them dogs. They are filthy dogs. They're not real Christians. Even though they're physical Jews and they're circumcised, they are enemies of the gospel, children of the devil, even though they think they're Christians. Beware of them. Now notice what he says in Philippians 3.3. 3. For we are the circumcision, you Gentiles, me, a Jew. We are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. We are the real circumcision, Christians. 
not the physical Jews who are physically circumcised, but not spiritually circumcised. We who are united to Christ, born of the Spirit, who have our hearts circumcised and our ears circumcised, cutting off that evil foreskin. We are the true circumcision. We are united to the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, taught by the Spirit, sealed by the Spirit, and by the Spirit worship God in the manner that God wants to be worshipped. A worship that's only accepted to God when we trust in Jesus. You got it? You got it? So, how does this point to Christ? Even though Mickey Ephrata got excited and he mentioned it, I've taught that on this previously. I want to show again how even something in circumcision points to Christ. Spiritual circumcision represents a new creation. The new creation refers to the fact that when you are united to Christ, God revives your inner person, your spirit that was dormant and enslaved to sin, makes it alive and fills your heart with love for Jesus and the love of the things that Jesus desires of you and puts a hatred in your heart for anything that's contrary to Jesus and grieves his heart. What do I mean by that? Let me explain. Before you were born again, before you were united to Christ and made alive spiritually by the Spirit, to you, premarital sex was no problem. Everyone's doing it. What's the big deal? To you, murdering an unborn child, that's not murder because it's not really a human life and it's pro-choice. To you, <clears throat> slandering something, no big deal. Gossiping, no big deal. Cheating, no big deal, as long as it <clears throat> got you ahead of the pack. Now that you've been made alive inwardly, now that your spirit has been made alive to des desire the things of God, to love the things of God, to think God's thoughts after him. Now you hate abortion and call it for what it is, murder. Now you condemn premarital sex. Now you're against homosexuality, LGBTQ, transgenderism. Whereas before that, you were all for it. But now what's changed? You've been made alive to think God's thoughts after him and see things the way God sees. Okay? Everyone want me there? But still, we are in flesh bodies that have a sinful inclination attached to them. So we still struggle with sin. So even though my inner man, my spirit, my heart have been made alive, that sinful desire, tendency, inclination hasn't been completely removed. It's still part of my flesh body. So I still struggle with it because now there's a war. That fleshly sinful inclination desires to tempt me to succumb to sin. That's why some of you struggle with, let's say, keeping yourself sexually pure. Some of you struggle with, let's say, <clears throat> cheating or, or lying or gambling. or dr These struggles are real struggles because you still have that sinful tendency in your flesh that no longer controls you, no longer has taken you captive to be a prisoner, but still does everything it can to tempt you to succumb of your own volition. You with me there? You understand what's happening now? So then, will we continue struggling with a sinful nature? No. Because you being born again is the deposit and the guarantee of what you're destined for. And what are you destined for? For you'll be completely transformed in such a way where your physical body will no longer have any sinful desires, inclination, all sinful passions and lusts will be completely removed. You'll be transformed in such a way where you'll no longer be able to sin. Christ will make you morally incorruptible and make your physical bodies indestructible. That's what the new creation points to. Philippians 3, 20 to 21. Philippians 3, 20 to 21.
Let me show you. Philippians 3, 20 to 21. Pay attention to what Paul says here. For our conversation, meaning our citizenship, is in heaven. We don't belong to the earth. We belong to Christ. Where Christ is, that's where heaven is. So if Christ is on earth, heaven is on earth. If Christ is in this spiritual dimension called heaven, that's heaven. Remember, heaven is not just a dimension of place. Heaven is a person. Jesus is our heaven. So now notice, we wait from this heavenly dimension. Jesus returned physically to the earth. And notice what he's going to do when he returns. Philippians 3.21. Who shall change our vile body, this body that decays, this body that gets sick, this body that causes me to struggle with sinful passions, this vile body, the day is coming, transformed. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to sub subdue, according to the working, to the power that enables Jesus to subject all things unto himself. Jesus possesses such a power. The kind of power that Jesus possesses is the kind of power that takes multitudes of Christians, billions of Christians who have lived. Raise them physically and then change their physical bodies to become morally incorruptible. That's the kind of power Jesus possesses. That's almighty power because he's God in the flesh. You catch it? So what does the new creation, circumcision of the heart and ears signify? It signifies the day in which you'll be completely transformed. Your physical body will no longer decay, will no longer grow weary, will no longer grow weak, will no longer die, and no longer struggle with sinful passions. But like Christ in his human nature, in his physical body, you'll be made morally incorruptible, physically indestructible. That's what circumcision of the heart and ears points to. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, 45, 49. Let me show you that, because now you're going to see how it points to Christ. How physical circumcision on the eighth day points to Christ's circumcision. I'm sorry, to Christ. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit, a spirit who gives life. Howbeit that was not first, which is spiritual. Jesus did not come first into the earth as a man. The first Adam did. But that which is natural, Adam, that which is soulish. He was the first Adam, and then Jesus came after him. And after that, that which is spiritual. Now watch this. The first man is of the earth. Adam was from the earth. He's from the earth. Okay? Earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Wow. The first Adam was from the dust of the earth. But the last Adam, he's not of the earth. He is the Lord of heaven itself. The only Lord in heaven is Jehovah. So Paul just told you the last Adam is Jehovah who came down from heaven to become man. Now let's read 48 and 49. Read with me, 48 and 49. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. In other words, like Adam was, we who are from Adam are like him. Understand, guys, this is what you got to understand now. Pay attention. Like Adam, so are we. If we belong to Adam, we're born of Adam, we're like Adam in his physical body, his human nature. Well, what happened to Adam? He sinned. He corrupted himself. He corrupted his flesh. And because of sin, he grew old and died. So what about us? We now bear his image. We now have a human nature, physical bodies like him. That's why, like him, we grow old and die and we struggle with sin. But what if you now belong to Jesus? And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Good news, believers. We are born of Adam, so we bear his image and his likeness. So like Adam became corrupted by sin, decayed and died physically. We have sinful passions that corrupt us, and we decay and die. But Christ has been raised physically, bodily, and he's immortal. So now if we belong to Christ, we will bear the image of Christ. So like Christ, we will be morally perfect and physically indestructible. Good news. And thank the second Adam for coming to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. 
Is it sinking in now? Okay. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 56. Now here's the point. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now, before you move on, let me explain. Before you post, hold on first, last post. Pause for a second. What does he mean by flesh and blood? He's not talking about physical bodies. Flesh and blood is Paul, Paul's way of saying bodies that are sinful, bodies that have sinful passions, body in which you have a sinful inclination. Those kind of bodies that struggle with sinful passions, those kind of bodies that have sinful desires and tendencies, those kind of bodies cannot enter heaven because the moment you enter, you'll be thrown out because you can't help but sin. And if you sin, God throws you out. You understand what he's saying here? You cannot enter heaven in these bodies because these bodies have sinful passions prone to sinning. So the moment you enter, you're going to sin and you'll be thrown right out. So that's why these are not the bodies that can dwell in God's presence in heaven or with God on earth permanently. You can't. It won't happen. So then what's the answer to this problem? 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 56. Carl, the context is when I block you and send you back to the pit of hell. To your dog pound. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. There you go. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal, this body that's dying, must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Death is no more. It's now decimated by Jesus. Right? O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. Let me explain verse 56. Okay. How does death sting you? Why do you die? Because of sin. Sin is death's sting. Its arrow hits you and kills you dead. And where does sin get its strength from? The law. I, I want you to understand what he just said. Let's post 1 Corinthians 15, 56 so you understand what Paul is saying. And then we're going to read 57 and 58. Okay. Paul, what do you mean the sting of death is sin? Sting, like a bee sting, right? Bzz, stings you. Or you're stung by an arrow. Okay. What he means is <clears throat> it is sin that makes you die. So why do you die? Because of sin. That's the sting of death. You sin, you're dead. And what's the strength of sin? Where does sin get its power? To cause you to die. The law. Now what does he mean by that? Sin is breaking the law. Anytime you break the law, you sin. Anytime you sin, death is inevitable. You die. So you see the connection? Law brings sin because you break it. Sin brings death. So when you break the law, you sin. When you sin, you die. 1 John 3 verse 4. 1 John 3 verse 4. What is sin? 1 John 3, verse 4. Okay. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, breaks the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And some of you said, where there's no law, there's no sin. Let me show you that from Paul. Romans 4, verse 15. You see how much meat there is in Scripture? And you see when you ask the Holy Spirit to guide a conversation, He does? Because all of this is the Holy Spirit putting in my heart and my mind to recall, to tie it in for the glory of Jesus by His power. Romans 4.15, Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. There you go. For where no law is, there is no transgression. When you don't have law, 
When there are no laws and you're not aware of the laws, then there's no sin because sin is violation of the law. Well, if you don't have a law or if you don't know the law, then you can't violate it. Romans 5.13. Romans 5.13. For until the law, sin was, was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. You see the amazing supernatural consistency of the Bible. How amazing the Bible, how deep and majestic this word of God is. It's amazing. But you see what he's saying here? No law, no sin, because sin is breaking the law. But when you know there's law and you break it, you sin. And when you sin, you die. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 verse 56 just said. The sting of death is sin. When you sin, death stings you. You die. And sin draws its power from the law that you break. When you break the law, sin now dominates you, empowers you, takes over, and makes you die. Now, before I move on, was all of this clear? Max, I can't answer that right now. I can answer that later, but not now. Yep. In other words, Terp, you keep feeding your sinful passions, desires every time you break the law. The more you obey the law by the power of the Holy Spirit, the more you mortify your sinful passions. The more you walk in union with the Spirit and obey the Spirit, the stronger you become in overcoming your sinful passions. So the more you pray, the more you sing, the more you fast, the more you study His Word, the more you go out and preach, visit the poor, the widow, the sick, the, those in prison, the more you fellowship with Christians, the stronger you become in the Spirit and the stronger you become in overcoming your sinful passion. Right? Okay. But what does 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 56 state? The time is coming when Jesus comes where we who have mortal bodies, mortal bodies of sin, flesh and blood, meaning sinful bodies that tempt us to sin and give in to sin, these bodies will be transformed to become incorruptible, immortal. That's what it means to be a new creature. That's what it means to be spiritual, spiritually circumcised. That's what it means to be born again. Born of the Spirit with your goal being <clears throat> transformed to be like Christ in Christ's human nature and physical body. Christ is morally incorruptible and his human body is physically indestructible. That's what we will become because we are bearing his image. Right? Clear? Romans 6, 3 to 10. Romans 6, 3 to 10. So I'm going to now tie it in with Jesus. So I think this will be the session. How physical circumcision is a shadow of Christ. Romans 6, 3 to 10. Read with me. Know ye not that so many of us, as we're baptized into Jesus, immersed into Christ, united to Christ by the Spirit, where we die to our old self and are raised a new creation in Christ, we're baptized into his death. So notice, if you're united to Christ, you are united with him in his death, right? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. So the old you, controlled by sin, dominated by sin, enslaved to sin, that old you died and was buried when you believed in Christ and united to Christ by the Holy Spirit. We shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, if you know you're buried with him, you'll be raised like him. Now, watch this. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin, that body that was enslaved to sin, controlled by sin, that body of ours has been destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now watch this. For he that is dead is freed from sin. You see what he just said? When a person physically dies, he's free from that sinful passion in his flesh body because he no longer has that flesh body to struggle with. But Paul is saying you need to consider yourselves as dead to that sinful desire 
Because being born again means you're united to Christ and now transformed to walk in holiness as Christ is holy and deny your sinful passions, war against it, and not submit to it. So consider yourselves as if you had died physically, actually, because the moment you die physically, you no longer carry with you sinful passions in heaven. You understand? You see the wisdom, the knowledge, the depth that Paul has received from the Holy Spirit to talk about these issues. But let, let me read 7 to nine, 10 again. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. He died because of our sins. It was our sins that he took, and he suffered the penalty of our sins, which is death. He was sinless, but he died because of our sins. And he did that once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Okay. Making sense to everyone now? What is spiritual circumcision? The new creation where God will transform us spiritually, mentally, psychologically, emotionally, physically, to become morally incorruptible and physically indestructible. Now, folks, who was the first one to be raised in a physical body that's indestructible, right? Who can no longer physically die. Death has no control over him. Who was the first one? Who ushered in that creation? Who is the head? The one who started that new creation. A new creation where human beings will be transformed to never die physically and to never sin again. Jesus, right? In other words, what you just told me is Jesus started this new creation. Jesus is the first fruits of a batch of human beings who will be spiritual, spiritually circumcised to become physically indestructible and morally incorruptible. And who is the first to experience that? Jesus, and he's the first fruits of a harvest that follows. Because if you know anything about <clears throat> harvesting, the first fruits of the crop is a guarantee that the rest of the crop is good and the rest of the crop will show up in due course, in due season, right? But if you don't have the first fruits, that means it's a bad crop, right? The first fruits, right? Is, is a sign of a good crop, good soil, good fruitage. It's going to produce, right? You're going to reap what you sowed. Well, who was the first fruits of the new creation? 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Well, if you know there's a first fruits, you know there's a harvest. The rest is going to come. You see it? He's the first fruits. He's not the only one. Guaranteeing the harvest is good and that another batch of crops are about to spring up. He's the guarantee. Folks, Jesus' resurrection is the guarantee. We're going to live forever. Death will no longer control us. We have conquered physical death and we will live forever because the first fruits has destroyed death. He's alive. He can never die. He's the guarantee. Praise him. He's the guarantee. He lives and we will live. Now watch this. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, so he's the first, afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. So what's the point? I had to take the long way to get to my point. To show you the biblical proofs from what, what I'm about to say. By the power of the Holy Spirit as he anoints me to speak clearly without error. I had to take this long route giving you verse after verse after verse from God's inspired word. Connecting dots to now show you the masterpiece. The pieces of the puzzle now we connect it. The physical act of circumcising, physical circumcision, points to something greater, spiritual circumcision. Spiritual circumcision refers to sinners, human beings, enslaved to sin, prone to death, 
having sinful passions, being saved from those sinful passions, being saved from physical death, being transformed to never physically die and never sin again, being made whole spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically. And the guarantee, that's what's going to happen. That That's our destiny. Christ is the first one to be raised, the first human being to be raised immortal, indestructible, as a guarantee that all who belong to him will follow suit and become like him. Clear? Colossians 1.18. Colossians 1.18. Because now you're going to see how it ties in with Jesus. Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have pre the preeminence. He is the one who conquered death, destroyed the power of death, <clears throat> overcame death by his resurrection to mortality. And he was the first to be raised immortal so that he would be the one to destroy the power of death. Right? And he is the beginning of the new creation. Do you catch it there? Is it all making sense? Did it sink in? Now you understand. Jesus is the head of a new creation, of a batch of spiritually circumcised human beings who are spiritually circumcised in union with him, a spiritual circumcision that comes as a result of his dying in our place to pay the debt of sin, and being raised immortal as a guarantee, that's our destiny in him. So he ushered in the new creation, the new birth, <clears throat> spiritual circumcision, right? He ushered it in. Colossians 2, 11 and 13. And now let's tie it in. Now let's tie it in. Colossians 2, 11 and 13. In whom also you are circumcised. See, in Jesus, in union with Jesus, because of what Jesus did and because of Jesus' death and you trusting in him and believing in him, you've been circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. This circumcision wasn't by human hands. And putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. The circumcision that Jesus has performed on you by the Spirit. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and an uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he made alive, quickened together with Jesus, having forgiven you all trespasses. You don't get any clearer than this passage that Jesus' death and resurrection is the head of, of a new creation that's renewed in him. Spiritually circumcised in him, transformed in him, to die to sin, conquer death, be raised immortal, indestructible. He did it by his life, death, and resurrection. Now, how does physical circumcision on the eighth day point to him? Mickey Erefrata remembered and recalled it. Folks, what day was Jesus raised from the dead? What day? What day was Jesus raised from the dead? Luis, everyone else, start listening. I hope Lily's still here. I hope he's listening or she's listening. What day was Jesus raised from the dead? Sunday, right? No, I didn't say you guys. Sunday. Sunday is the first day of the week, and it's the day after Sabbath. It is the eighth day. See, so you got it. Is it a coincidence Jesus was raised on the eighth day? Because that's the day after Saturday, the seventh day, and the eighth day is Sunday, the first day of the week. So he was raised on the eighth day, which is the first day of a new creation. Jesus was raised on Sunday, the first day of a new creation, which is also the eighth day, the day after Sabbath, the seventh day. Do you see how it all points to Jesus, even physical circumcision? I don't know why it seems strange to you. In other words, you don't get circumcised on the seventh day. 
you get circumcised on the eighth day. But there is no eighth day, technically speaking, because the eighth day is the first day. So God did this deliberately to point to Jesus' resurrection on Sunday. Why Sunday? Because it kills two birds with one stone. That's the first day of a new creation, and it's the eighth day. Eighth day represents, symbolizes the new creation ushered in by Christ who was raised on Sunday, the first day of the new creation because his resurrection starts the new creation. So if you wanted to know, when is the first day of the new creation? When Jesus was raised from the dead. That's the first day of a new creation. Thank you, Tommy. Do you see how literally everything points to Jesus? I don't know what you mean by a new cycle, because the first day of a new creation won't be repeated. It's the first day of a new creation, and that's the first day that now will go on to the ages of ages. And what does he complete that work of the new creation when he returns and raises us and transforms us? So you understand now how everything is pointing to Jesus, even something as simple as physical circumcision. Right? Is it sinking in? Because I'm not going to bring up another one because, yeah, I won't have much time. Yeah, I'm not going to have much time. Go back and re-listen to this to see how the pattern is from the Old Testament all the way on. Yeah, I don't have because it's already 96 minutes. If I start another one, it's going to take too long. And I, already people want me to do smaller sessions, which God willing, hopefully we start next month, Lord willing, as, the God, as God provides. I'm going to be doing pre-recorded sessions like David Wood does and Apostate Prophet, hopefully, if this man works with me by his grace and mercy and teaches me the ropes. So I'll be having small sessions, like pre-recorded <clears throat> sessions, and then live streams. I'll still do the live streams. No, but uh, Bass, you guys are hungry for the word, and you'll listen to two hours. We live at a time where if you do more than 15 minutes, you zone people out, and they won't even bother to watch or listen. Right? Right? So what, what do I want? I want, I want to, yeah, let me see. man. Is there another one I can point to? But no, I don't think so. No, I can't. Let me then just prepare you, prepare you for what's to come. Because the next one I'm going to do is Adam and Eve as a shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, people have already heard this, but it's worth, worth hearing. Yeah, let me see if, should I do something in Genesis 3 real quickly? I'm trying to figure out. Sorry, guys, because I'm saying there's so much meat. There's so much meat, right? Genesis 3, all right. Okay, let me, uh, let me just give you Solomon real quickly. Solomon will be very easy. Okay, Solomon, the son of uh, David, had two names, right? Did you guys know he has two names? God gave him two names. Uh, now, many of you know... The, what the two names are. He's called Jedidiah and he's called Shlomo, Solomon. 2 Samuel 12, 24 to 25. Let me show you what the two names are. I'm going to use some because that's quick. It's going to be real quick. 2 Samuel 12, 24 to 25. Pedro, do you want me to repeat a two-hour session that I just did on how it points to Christ, uh, Pedro? I can. I'll start it all over again. Why don't you rewind, listen from the beginning, and then you'll see how it connects. 2 Samuel 12, 24 to 25. Guys, pay attention. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her. And she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon. And Jehovah loved him. The Lord loved him. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and he called his name Jedidiah because of Jehovah. Notice Solomon has two names, Shlomo and Yedidiah. Yedidiah means loved of Jehovah, the beloved of Jehovah. Jehovah loves him. So do you catch Solomon's name? Solomon, Shlomo. Jedediah. Shlomo means rest and peace. Jedediah means 
beloved of Jehovah, loved by Jehovah. Shlomo means rest in peace. So why was he given the name Shlomo? Now you see he's called Jedidai, right, Corey? Koiru, Ko you saw that, right? He said, call him Jedidiah. No, you don't love Jesus. You love Esau, who's a satanic counterfeit, whom Satan inspired through your false prophet, Muhammad, the son of Satan. Okay. Shlomo means rest and peace. Let's go to 1 Chronicles 22, verses 7 to 10. 1 Chronicles 22, verses 7 to 10. This will be quick, so I can do this. And David said to Solomon, my son, and David said to Solomon, my son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house unto the name of Jehovah, my God. Pay attention now. Pay attention. But the word of Jehovah came to, him, to me saying, thou hast shed blood abundantly. You've shed too much blood and has made great wars, too many wars. Thou shall not build a house unto my name because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. Behold, the son shall be born to thee who shall be a man of rest, a man of rest, and will give him rest. I'll give him rest. All his enemies round about for his name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. Now notice what it says about Solomon. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall, build, shall be my son, and I will be his father. I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Guys, notice about Solomon. Solomon is Jedidiah meaning beloved of Jehovah. Solomon is Shlomo. Shlomo comes from the root where we get Shalom. Shalom means peace, wholeness. It can also mean rest, okay? So Solomon is called Shlomo because he's a man of rest, a man of peace. In his days, God would bring peace and rest to Israel. He's also Jedidiah. Pay attention. He's Jedidiah because he's beloved of Jehovah. He's also God's son who sits on the throne, and he will build God's house. Did you catch all that? Or do we need to repeat it again? First Chronicles 22, 7 and 10. Do we need to repeat that or you saw all that? God said, he will be my son. I'll be his father. Right? He'll sit on the throne. I'll establish his throne. He'll build me a house. His name is Shlomo because he's a man of rest and peace. Because I'll bring peace and rest in his days. Shlomo coming from the same root where we get Shalom. Shalom meaning peace and wholeness and rest. He's my son, my beloved son, the son of whom I love. I'm his father. He's a man of peace, a man of rest, right? <clears throat> and he'll build my house and sit on a throne. You catching it? So Shlomo is a man of peace. Jesus is our peace. He's the prince of peace. Shlomo is the beloved of Jehovah. Jesus is the beloved of Jehovah. Shlomo is the son of God. God is his father. Jesus is God's son and God is his father. Shlomo sat on the throne of Jehovah on earth. Jesus sat on God's throne in heaven. Let me show you where Shlomo, Solomon, sits on God's throne on earth. Go to 1 Chronicles 28, verses 4 to 6. We'll read to 7. 1 Chronicles 28, verses 4 to 7. Watch where I'm going with this. Howbeit the Lord God of Israel chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he had chosen Judah to be the ruler, and of the house of Judah, the house of my father. And among the sons of my father, he liked me to make me king over all Israel. Now watch what he says about Solomon. And of all my sons, for Jehovah the Lord hath given me many sons. He, ha he hath chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of Jehovah over Israel. So God's earthly throne is in Jerusalem. Who sits on God's earthly throne? Jedediah, the beloved of Jehovah. Shlomo, the man of peace and rest. The son of God, Solomon. Catch it? And he said unto me, Solomon thy son, he shall build my house and my courts. For I have chosen him to be my son and I'll be his father. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever. If he be constant to do my commandments and my judgments as at this day. You caught it now? Got it? 1 Chronicles 29, 23. 1 Chronicles 29, 23. Almost done, folks. 1 Chronicles 29, 23. Then Solomon sat on the throne of Jehovah as king instead of David his father. So wait. Solomon sits on the throne of Jehovah. Jehovah is Solomon's father. Solomon is the beloved of Jehovah. 
And Solomon is a man of peace and rest. And he sits on Jehovah's throne on earth, his earthly throne. And he builds the house, the temple for Jehovah, for people to worship God. in. All right. Wow. Amazing. As king, instead of David, his father, and prosper, and all Israel obeyed him. Now notice what it says in 1 Chronicles 29, 25. 1 Chronicles 29, 25. And Jehovah magnified Solomon exceedingly in the sight of all. So notice, Jehovah exalted Solomon exceedingly, exalted him, hmm, and bestowed upon him such royal majesty as had not been on any king before him in Israel. Wow, wow, wow. So not only did Solomon sit on Jehovah's throne on earth, not only is Solomon the beloved son of Jehovah, Jehovah being his father, not only is Solomon a man of peace and rest, Jehovah exalted Solomon exceedingly. Hmm. Exalted him. Exceedingly, highly exalted him. In fact, can you do me a favor? First last, post First Chronicles 29.25 from the NIV. But watch where I'm going to go with this. Watch where I'm going to go with this. Watch here. Almost done. The Lord highly exalted Solomon in the sight of all Israel and bestowed on him royal splendor such as no king over Israel ever had before. So now let's connect him with Jesus. Let's connect him with Jesus. Philippians 2 verse 9. Let's, let me show you how Solomon is a picture of Jesus. Philippians 2 verse 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. So Solomon, like Jesus, highly exalted. Solomon, like Jesus, highly exalted. Solomon is the beloved son of Jehovah, and Jehovah is his father. Matthew 3, 17. Matthew 3, 17. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Wow, so Solomon, like Jesus, is the beloved son of God, God being their father. Wow. Solomon, like Jesus, highly exalted. Solomon, like Jesus, sits on Jehovah's throne. Solomon sat on Jehovah's earthly throne. Jesus sits on Jehovah's heavenly throne. He's in heaven, on the throne with the Father in heaven. Hebrews 1.3. Hebrews 1.3. Watch here. Watch here. Wait, I'm not doing hey, You think this is enough? Watch what's going to happen, Christian warrior. Hebrews 1 3. Before the rapture, first and last. Don't leave us behind unless I got to read. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 8, verse 1. Hebrews 8, verse 1. Noodles, me and David, unfortunately, are brothers for life. We love each other and we'll fight for each other till death because we belong to Jesus. Even though he's a hater, he's je jealous, he's envious, and he'll never be able to do what I do. He'll never be as good as me. I still love him. Hebrews 8, verse 1. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who sit on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Is it clear that Jesus sits on his father's heavenly throne, Jehovah's heavenly throne, where Solomon sat on Jehovah's earthly throne? So you see the connection? Like Jesus, Solomon sits on God's throne. The difference is he sat on God's throne on earth. Jesus sits on God's throne in heaven. Like Jesus, he's the beloved son of God. God is his father, right? Like Jesus, he's highly exalted. Okay, wait, any other connections? Solomon, his name Shlomo means peace and rest. What about Jesus? Is he a man of peace? Is he a man of rest? Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Almost done, folks. I hope this is blessing you. 
Everything good is from the Trinity, Isaac. Give him glory. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Oh, so like Solomon, Jesus gives right rest. Like Jesus, Solomon gives rest. Jesus, come to me, I will give you rest. John 14, 27. John 16, 33. John 14, 27. John 16, 33. Yep, Prince of Peace. But I'm giving ones that clearly are Jesus. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I give you peace. I leave you my peace. John 16, 33. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So he's saying, don't be afraid. Don't worry. Don't fear what you're experiencing in the world. Trust in me. Let me fill you with my peace and rest, because the world cannot consume you, because my peace covers you. Okay, clear there? Romans 5, verse 1. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, write down, but don't post this. Write down Ephesians 2. Well, you know what? Yeah, we're going to read that. Okay. Yeah, that we're going to have to read. Uh, Colossians 1, 19 and 20. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. Watch here. Wait, wait, guys. Ooh, you, we ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So Jesus made peace between God and us by the blood of his cross. He reconciled us to God. He is our peace. His peace preserves us from being consumed by the worries of the world. And we come to him and he gives us rest. Wow. Ephesians 2, 11 to 17. Ephesians 2, 11 to 17. Guys, pay attention. We're almost done. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles, you non-Jews, who are not ethnic Jews, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision. The Jews are physically circumcised, call you uncircumcision by way of insult. Right? Okay. <clears throat> All the circumcision flesh made by hands. That at that time ye were without Christ. You didn't know who Christ was. You didn't know who the God in Christ happened to be. Because you are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You are not part of the heritage of Israel. You did not share in the covenant of Israel to know who the true God was. You were foreigners and aliens worshiping gods and goddesses and pursuing your lustful passions. Strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world because you didn't know who the true God was. But now in Christ Jesus, now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh, are brought near, united to God by the blood of Christ. Notice 14. For he is our peace, who had made both one and had broken down the middle wall of partition between us, the division between Jews and Gentiles, the hostility between Jews and Gentiles. He's abolished it because he made Jews and Gentiles united together forever in Jesus. He's made us one man in Jesus by his blood, by his love. And now we Gentiles share in the commonwealth of Israel. We are citizens with Israel and we are heirs of the covenants of Israel because of Jesus. All because of him. Praise him. This would not happen without him. Okay. Now let's read 15 to 17. 15 to 17. Having abolished in his flesh. By dying in the flesh, dying physically because of our sins, his death destroys division, hatred, animosity. His death removes racial barriers. His death removes ethnic barriers. His death abolishes the mentality that one race is superior to another. That's been abolished, done away with. There is no black and white, no Jew or Gentile, no white European. Black African, because in Jesus, that's been abolished. Right? 
in the flesh, then many, even the law of commandments contain an ordinance for to make in himself, in union with him, of the two twain, one new man, and so making peace, and that he might reconcile both Jews and Gentiles unto God in one body, spiritual body, his body, of which he's the head. And he did it by his cross, having slain by his cross the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. Making sense now? Making sense? Now, Ephesians 2, 18 and 22, the final connection between Solomon and Jesus. And I'm going to recap the connections. Ephesians 2, 18 and 21. Uh, Ephesians 2, 18 and 22, 22. Ephesians 2, 18 and 22. For through him, notice, through Jesus, because of Jesus, because of what Jesus did, his life and his death, his resurrection, because of him and for the sake of Jesus, through him, watch what it says, through him, Jew or Gentile, male or female, black or white, young or old, free or slave, because of Jesus, for the sake of Jesus, we have access to the Father. I can go directly to the Father because of Jesus. He's given me the Spirit, and by the Holy Spirit living in me, sealing me, preserving me, teaching me, by the Spirit, I have access to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers, you Gentiles. You're no more foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints, and you are of the household of God and are built, pay attention to the language, upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the buildings, see, we're a building, folks. We're a temple, folks. We're a house, a spiritual house. And the bricks are human lives. You're a brick. I'm a brick. First, last is a brick. Someone is a window. Someone is a door. We are all a spiritual body, pieces of the same spiritual house, being built by the Spirit because of Jesus, for the sake of Jesus, as a building, as a temple, as a house, so God the Father can live in us, right? And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone that keeps the building together, the walls together. He's the one, the Father keeps it together. In whom all the building fitly framed together, growing unto, notice what it says in 21, 22, a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Did you guys catch it? Like Solomon built a temple, Jesus has built a temple for his father. Solomon built a physical temple on earth in Jerusalem. Jesus built, Jesus built a spiritual temple the bricks of which are human souls, human lives that he has redeemed. So the building that Jesus built is greater in value than the one that Solomon built because Solomon built a temple, physical temple on earth with bricks. Jesus has built God a spiritual house, a spiritual temple made of human souls, human lives, sealed by the Spirit, covered by the blood of Jesus, so that God will dwell in us forever and we will never be destroyed. So let's recap. Right? Like Jesus, Solomon is the beloved son of God. God is his father. Like Jesus, Solomon is a man of peace and rest. Right? <clears throat> like Jesus, Solomon sat on God's throne. And like Jesus, Solomon built a temple for God. Now notice, Solomon sat on God's earthly throne and built an earthly temple. Jesus sat on God's heavenly throne and built a spiritual temple on earth when he poured out the Holy Spirit. Now, is it a coincidence that like Solomon only built the temple when he took the throne after David died, Jesus only built the spiritual temple after he took the throne in heaven after he poured out the Spirit? Yes, Ortho Christos. The spiritual temple is the church. Amen. I thought that was clear. I'm sorry. The church is the spiritual temple of Jesus Christ. Everyone got it now? Can anyone doubt that Solomon is a picture of Jesus? Okay. Medic, when did Solomon build the physical earthly temple? When he took the throne. When did Jesus build the spiritual temple? 
when he took heaven's throne, because that's when he poured out the Spirit, giving birth to the church, the temple of the living God. Clear? Ah, now let's go out with a bang. Let's go out with a bang. Now, before I do that, before I do that, in all honesty, how many of you have been blown away by how all these events and all these persons point to Jesus Christ, even though Jesus Christ is the greater reality of these events? Doesn't this erase your doubts and destroy your fears and strengthen and embolden you to know the Bible is the word of God? The God of the Bible lives, he's real, and Jesus is alive. Right? And it makes you just fall in love with the God of the Bible even more. But wait, you thought this blew you away? This one's going to knock you out. It's going to knock you out of the park. You thought this was amazing? Now, first and last, Mickey, thou shalt not pontificate. They already know this because I've mentioned this over and over again. Let's go to 2 Samuel 7, 14. Let us see what God says will happen to Solomon when he sins. No, Annika, all you need to do is go listen and re-listen and pass on the links to others or upload them to your YouTube page until you memorize it. Okay, guys, notice God's threat and warning to Solomon if he sins. I will be his father, he shall be my sin. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men. Guys, pay attention. This is where you got to pay attention. When and if Solomon sins, David, I will beat him with the rod of men. I will have men beat him with rods and with the stripes of the children of men. God is saying, if Solomon sins, David, I will raise up men to beat him with rods and to flog him, to whip him. Luis and everyone else, I need you to pay attention here because you're going to get blown away. Okay. Roman Catholic demon, son of Satan, be gone. Don't disgrace your church, you filthy demon. Pay attention to this. This guy gives Catholics a bad name. Thank God they're not, not all are like him. Okay, now pay attention to this. God says to David, if Solomon sins, David, I'm going to raise up men to beat him with rods and to whip him. Stripes of men, whip him. Now I want you to write down 1 Kings 11. We're not going to read it. 1 Kings 11, Solomon sinned. 1 Kings 11 says, Solomon took 700 wives and 300 concubines, 1,000 women, foreigners who worshiped false gods and goddesses, and it said that Solomon started worshiping their gods and even sacrificed the mullik. Solomon fell in great sin. He multiplied foreign women and worshiped their gods, and God was angry. This is 1 Kings 11. God says to Solomon, because of what you did, my punishment will be, I will now divide the kingdom of Israel. I will take a part of the kingdom and give it to the hands of your enemy, but I will keep a part of it intact in the household of David for the sake of David. In other words, I'm going to divide the nation into two, Judah and Israel. I'm going to split the kingdom into two, the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah, kingdom of Israel in the north, kingdom of Judah in the south. So the kingdom of, of David will be in Judah in the south, but the kingdom of Israel will be given to the hand of your enemy because I'm not going to remove the kingdom completely from David because of my promise to David. But then he says something else. And for the sake of your father, David, I won't punish you and I won't remove you. I'll keep you and leave you as king till you die. I will divide the kingdom in the lifetime of your son. Are you with me there? See what he said? So God did not punish Solomon. God did not punish Solomon. But wait, God, when you say something, you cannot go against your word. You said, if Solomon sins, you're going to raise up men to beat him with rods and to whip him. That would be his punishment. Even though you won't condemn him to hell, even though you won't remove him from your presence forever, you will punish him, but still restore him and forgive him. But God, you never punished him. You never raised up men to beat him with rods or to whip him. Why? Let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. Why do you think Jesus was beaten with rods and whipped? He was taking the punishment of Solomon 
and all the sons of David who deserved it, which God spared them from. Did you catch it? Why do you think Jesus was whipped by men and beaten with the rods of men? Because the punishment that Solomon and the sons of David deserve was withheld because their punishment would be taken by their substitute, the greater Solomon, the greater David, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Okay? Anyone doubt that all of it is about Jesus? It's all about Jesus. It's about his glory, about his majesty, about his beauty, about his love. And it's all about praising him, worshiping him, loving him, magnifying him, glorifying him, living for him, <clears throat> obeying him, dying for him, and proclaiming him. It's all about Jesus. So let me recommend when you finish this, find the song on YouTube where it's where that song is. It's all about you, Jesus. Right? It literally is all about him. I am not exaggerating. I cannot emphasize this enough. It is all about him. That's why Colossians 1.16 says, the entire creation was created for Jesus. It's not a lie. That is infinitely true. It is true to 100 million percent. I don't know, you know, it's all about the Father's beloved Son, Jesus Christ. You exist, I exist, creation exists to worship Jesus to love Jesus, to adore Jesus, to thank Jesus, to live for Jesus, to be a slave of Jesus. It's all about him. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will use my meager efforts, these sessions, to cause us to love Jesus more, to be more in love, more in awe of Jesus, to live more powerfully for Jesus, to sacrifice everything, even our lives, if necessary, for Jesus until we meet Jesus in our glorified bodies, in our glorified state, and see him physically and visibly as he is, to then have those arms embrace us, hug us, and those human lips of Jesus kiss us. Take a moment to think about that, because it's going to happen. Jesus is alive. He's not dead. He's alive in his physical body, so he has a physical body that's glorified, immortal, indestructible. Saints, saints. Pay attention. Let this sink in by the power of the Holy Spirit. Your goal is to meet Jesus. And when you meet him, not only will you bow before him because he's worthy and kiss his feet. You know what you're going to experience? And I pray it sinks in by the Spirit and I want you to visualize it. Jesus with a smile that lights up heaven and earth looking at you. And then embracing you in his arms. And looking at you, he says to you, my child, I love you. I'm in love with you. And in those beautiful human lips kissing your head and kissing your cheeks. And he says, this is where you belong in my everlasting arms. Because you're mine and I adore you. And I've etched you in my heart. So we say, we love you too. Though imperfectly, we ache for the day by the power of the Spirit where we love you perfectly as you deserve. And Jesus, my Lord, make us love you more and fall more in love with you and save us and save me from my flesh. And Lord Jesus, keep me free. Save me from this corrupt system to serve you and bless your people and bless our loved ones. Bless my daughters. Lord Jesus, it's her birthday this Thursday. Do a miracle for her. Please, Lord. You love her more than I can imagine. And we love you, Son of God. We are in love with you, Son of God. Keep us holy and pure for your glory. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again physically, bodily, to judge the living and the dead. And Jesus is definitely Yehovah, God Almighty in the flesh, to the glory of the Father and one with the Spirit.
Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. The Lord Jesus bless you and love you. Pray for me. Pray for my miracle. I'm still waiting for a positive decision from the appellate court. Pray God will turn the appellate court favorably towards me and my daughters and save me for his glory. Provide for the ministry. Save me from false brethren who are trying to slander me, to silence them and expose them, to keep my daughters healthy and safe. And pray for her birthday this Thursday that the Lord Jesus will do a miracle for my daughters and I. Somehow they'll be in my arms in Jesus' name. Remember, Jesus loves you more than you can imagine. He's alive. He's real. And the Bible is all about him. Lord willing, tomorrow I'll be on 5 p.m. between 5 and 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Between 5 and 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Lord willing, I'm going to explain the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. Jumping like a monkey. I was just thinking about you. I was mentioning being. I said, where am I jumping like a monkey? So I just did it, man. I'm by the window, brother. My brother from a different mother like no other. Guys, rejoice. Jesus is alive. He is risen. He's destroyed death. He's conquered Satan and the world. He is real. He can never die. And he really, truly loves us and is in love with us. We love you, Lord Jesus. Son of God, we love you. Take care, guys. Christ is risen. Risen indeed.